Um, I'm aware of the irony of being the moderator for a discussion with sort of the ultimate uh, moderator, the Speaker of the UK House of Commons, but we have around half an hour for a Q&A and also from comment, for comments from the audience. Um, so who would like to, to start us off? As a friend? Yeah, please. Maybe you could briefly introduce yourself also before speaking, that would be fantastic. But there are also microphones here. If, uh, yeah. Hello, um, I'm Sandy Prajkopal. I'm a first year at the Heritage School of Governance. And I'm German, but I used to study in the UK for three years. I did my bachelor's at Kiel University. Ask. Kiel, Kiel. Kiel. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you very much for a very entertaining and um, intriguing speech. Um, I wanted to ask, the House of Commons is infamous for its level of wit and banter, um, especially on question time. Um, how do you find, as a challenge, of presiding over deciding um, where it borders between wit and where it borders to insults, like the borderline between the two when speakers speak? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a daily challenge, if I can put it that way. There used to be, it's an interesting point, there used to be a prescribed, by which I mean proscribed, list of words words that were on the list because they were unparliamentary. The prescribed list was finally scrapped some decades ago, I think because it was becoming unseasonably long. And no such list specifically now exists, although it's very well understood that you cannot accuse another member of being a liar other than in very rare circumstances, which I think I alluded to at the beginning, namely if there are is a particular motion on the order paper which is all about the conduct of an individual minister, for example, then in those circumstances it can be legitimate, though it's still not popular for someone to accuse someone else of lying. But liar is an inappropriate term. We attribute or attach much importance to the idea, you may think this quaint, but I think it has something to be said for it, that members are honourable. After all, they're known as honourable members or if they're members of the Privy Council body that's made up of people at least nominally there to advise Her Majesty, then they're the right honourable. We attach, therefore, much importance to the idea that people are honourable and people of integrity. So something which essentially accuses a member of being dishonourable is out of order. You can't accuse a member of being a hypocrite. You can talk about, ironically, a party and damn its hypocrisy. You can get away with that because the charge isn't personal in character. But if the charge is clearly directed at an individual member by another member, then I would ask for the term to be withdrawn. It's a slightly more debatable point, but you're not supposed to accuse another member of being disingenuous because that is to attribute a impure motive. And the principle is that we don't do that. Similarly, you're not supposed to accuse another member of misleading the house. You can get away with it if you say inadvertently. If you say, well, I think the minister, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure inadvertently has misled the House, then a member can get away with that. Not that that's a mark of great wit, but you can get away with that. But you can't simply say the simple fact, Mr. Speaker, is that the minister has misled the House. Now, however bizarre you may think it, in those circumstances, I would rise and I say, oh, order, the honourable gentleman, the honourable lady, We'll have to rephrase that. That term must be withdrawn. And it does apply at all levels, to be honest. So even with the Prime Minister, although the Prime Minister gets some latitude, for example, in terms of length of answers and that sort of thing, the Prime Minister mustn't use such language either. And on one occasion, I think the Prime Minister called Ed Balls a muttering idiot. And I asked the Prime Minister to withdraw that term, which he did. And one or two people said, wow, you know, you even do it to the Prime Minister. Well, you know, it's this principle that everybody has to play by the rules. And, you know, even if it's the Prime Minister, if he uses a term he shouldn't use, then, you know, he will be asked to withdraw it. So how do you observe the balance? Well, I mean, I think one quite admires a member whose use of language is so dexterous or ingenious that he is capable or she is capable of uttering the most ferocious criticism with gilded tongue. You know, if it can be done in a way that's witty. I'll give you an example of somebody who's very good at it, not universally popular. Most politicians worth their salt aren't universally popular. Secretary of State Gove, the Education Secretary, is certainly an extremely 
capable performer in Parliament, generally very popular with his own side and pretty unpopular on the Labour side. Michael Gove has got a capacity for <laughs> referring to other members in terms that are elaborate and nominally polite, but which, if reflected upon, will be seen to be pretty damning. <laughs> now, some people, you know, think he's patronising, you know, but he has got a habit of saying, well, that's a typically acute observation by the Honourable Gentleman. Well, I congratulate the Honourable Gentleman, who certainly brought to my notice a matter of considerable import, even though the matter brought to his notice is as banal a matter as could possibly have been raised at any time that afternoon. Uh, Michael will sort of lavish the person with superficial praise and then proceed to explain why in this particular case, notwithstanding my very real and deep-rooted admiration for the Honourable Gentleman, he does, I think, suffer from the quite notable disadvantage of being wrong. <laughs> Now, on the whole, I think one sort of admires those members, and there are members on both sides who are witty. I would say on the Conservative side, amongst the new members, Jacob Rees-Mogg, who is the son of the recently deceased former editor of The Times, William Rees-Mogg, Jacob Rees-Mogg is a character. I mean, an extraordinary character. He's what you would call, if you're familiar with this term in Britain, a young fogey. He sort of dresses in a very old-fashioned way, often with a waistcoat, and he's always got his handkerchief in his the right place, and, you know, he's very trad in every way, immensely courteous, and Jacob, I think, almost takes the rise out of himself. He's got a habit of getting up and asking questions in a manner that would have been done 50 years ago. Is my right honourable friend aware that it invariably falls to this great party of ours to rescue the country from the ravages of debt and despair which it's been the historic failing of the socialists to deliver to us? You know, that's very much a sort of Jacob Rees-Mogg type question. And, and Jacob is a, an unusual character, but he's a good parliamentarian. And, and actually, although I think the Labour Party regarded him as a curious sort of figure who sort of wandered into the House from a different century, and, you know, he, I would say he's not disliked. Not disliked. I mean, what, what is really disliked is people who are very personally nasty. You know, and that's, you know if you can express yourself with, with a degree of wit, then much else is forgiven. Sorry, that's he, a very long answer to your question. I'll try to do better. He would like to, to go next. The deathly hush. But that sometimes happens, and then sometimes... Like, oh, I think good. we have one. Yeah, other people. Yeah, um, also as another Brit. Um, I just wonder what led you, who had been, as you say, a member of the Conservative Party, presumably with convictions, political convictions, stretching back 29 years, what um, led you to give up your expression of uh, those political convictions in order to preside over the House itself? A number of factors. In order, I would say, first, because I didn't want to be a minister. I didn't think I would be very good at being a minister. And I didn't think there was the foggiest chance of being asked by David Cameron to be a minister. So my sort of starting point, ladies and gentlemen, was that I didn't want, as most people do want, to be part of the executive. I just didn't think I was a a very effective team player, and I had no passion for government service. Now then, of course, that still doesn't really answer your question, because you could say, well, you know, you could perfectly well have continued as a backbench member, pursuing your various interests in international development and human rights and special educational needs provision and so on. And you're absolutely right, I could have done. I think if, truth be told, most of us in Parliament have an element of hubris, or at least of extreme self-confidence, and we like to think that we've got a contribution to make. And although I wouldn't have been distraught to have continued as a backbench member, ploughing my own furrow as a rather independent-minded member of my party, I had always, in otherwise a rather checkered and inconsistent career, been pretty consistent about one thing, and that was that I was absolutely passionate about Parliament. And I thought to myself, how much that's new do I have left to say? Now, you may not find this a convincing answer, but it is an honest one. 
And I honestly concluded, ladies and gentlemen, that I wasn't an original thinker. <laughs> in fact, you know how your loved ones are often, those closest to you are best at telling you these hard truths. My wife, who is notably outspoken on virtually all matters under the sun, once said to me, you know, you're very good, honey, but you're not, you're not an original thinker. In fact, I said to her, if I'd not been a politician, I'd like to have been either a lawyer or an academic. And she said to me, oh, I think you would have been a very good lawyer. I don't think you would have been a very good academic. And I said, well, you know, th thanks for your bluntness. Why wouldn't I have been any good as an academic? To which my wife replied, well, you're not an original thinker. You're very good at communicating what you do believe. And uh, oh, I said, you mean my completely banal and unoriginal thoughts? And she said, well, something like that, yeah. But you're not an original thinker. Now, people incidentally tell me that actually you don't have to be an original thinker to be a good academic. A lot of academics aren't particularly good original thinkers. They're often very good researchers or very good at analysing other people's material or whatever. But anyway, that's another question. I came to the conclusion that I had nothing new to contribute as a backbencher. So I thought, well, I'm not going to be a minister. And if I go on as a backbencher, I can keep pursuing these themes, but I have nothing really original to contribute that the House needs to hear from me. And I think, rightly or wrongly, that I would be a competent and fair chair of the proceedings of the House because I believe in the rights of backbench members and I like standing up for the ordinary member against, if necessary, the otherwise omnipotent executive. So I thought, well, I'd be good at this and if the chance arises, if the vacancy comes, then I'll have a go. And, and basically that's what happened. My predecessor, Michael Martin, stood down a bit before he'd intended and, and if I'm honest about it, a bit earlier than I'd expected. But I decided to get myself, if he was agreeable, which fortunately for me he was, onto his panel of chairman in 2005, which is a sort of training ground, if you like. It's a service to the House. I chaired debates in Westminster Hall, the subsidiary chamber, and I chaired legislation committees. So I got used to the role of the impartial chair. And I thought, well, if Michael at some point calls it a day, I'll take soundings, as you do. You know, I'll get somebody to scout around and see if there's any support for me. And if there is, I'll have a go. And, and it's not such a big shift because although I was giving up my right to express my views, I was no longer tribal. I had no very tribal allegiance anymore. I would never wanted to be a member of any other party. But some of the sort of ping pong had become, or punch and judy show, for me rather tedious. I was interested in subjects that often were of a cross-party character, so SEN, constitutional reform, LGBT equality, and so on. And I was quite used to working with members, not just of my own party, but of others. So I thought, well, I'll have a go. When I decided to stand, the Conservative Chief Whip, with admirable candour, said to me, John, you can stand for Speaker, but you'll lose. And I said to him, well, <laughs> Patrick, you may be right. Uh, you may be right. I don't know. But there's no shame. There's no shame in trying. I remember once when Tony Benn was slaughtered when he stood for the deputy leadership of the Labour Party. And afterwards, um, David Dimbleby said to him, well, Mr Benn, and this was very much in my mind, he said, Mr Benn, you've been absolutely slaughtered. And Benn just sort of smiled and said, in fact, you've been humiliated. And Tony Benn said, humiliated? Mr Dimbleby, humiliated? He said, I've never been humiliated in my life. He said, I stood for the office, I made the arguments, I set out my case, I put forward what I thought was a credible proposition and the party chose somebody else. There's no shame in that. And I said to Patrick McLaughlin, you know, you may be right, maybe I'll lose and I think I've got a decent chance of winning but there's no shame in having a go. I tell you something, it's better to be thinking in your dotage you had a go than bitterly regretting. I would have bitterly regretted it if I'd not had a go. And as I say, whether I'm any good at it is not for me to say, but if I die tomorrow, for which I have no plans, um, <laughs> I will die happy because I think I've been very lucky. Who'd like to go next? Uh, yes, please. Um, yeah, my name is Kieran Heinemann. I'm um, from the Humboldt University just around the corner. From which? Humboldt? Oh, Humboldt, yeah. 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 Um, Mr. Barco. Um, I don't know when it started, but as far as I know, um, you didn't have television broadcast uh, from Parliament um, maybe before 1980 or something? 80, 88, I think it was, 87, okay, 88. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you, you definitely had it before in Germany. And uh, I would like to know and um, whether you can tell us in which way um, parliamentary um, yeah. culture... <laughs> I'm sorry, if this is the effect I have on people, I do apologise. <laughs> um, Please, yes. 
whether you uh, know um, in which way it made people change in the, in the House of Commons, knowing that um, there's always a camera around and everything they do and say is being recorded. How's it changed Parliament being televised? Well, I don't myself think it's changed it for the worse. I'll put my cards on the table and say I'm an advocate of it. I think in any case, it's always very difficult, ladies and gentlemen, isn't it, to go back in life. You know, we are where we are. So even if I thought that it was adverse for us because it showed people picking their noses or behaving badly or whatever, I think that, you know, the die is cast. We've made this leap, this great leap forward, as the case may be, and, you know, there's no way that the people would now accept us going back to an age when Parliament wasn't televised. Sometimes people say, or sometimes people in advance of the decision to televise said, a number of parliamentarians on both sides said, no, no, this is a mistake. I mean, the House voted for it, so there was a majority in favour, but there was a significant large minority against. And one of the arguments was, ugh, it will be an exhibitionist's paradise. People will play to the cameras, people will show off and use more extravagant language or behave in a show-off sort of way. It won't be good for the dignity of the House and so on. On the whole, I think that those fears have been confounded. Is that because people don't sort of show off at all or ever play to the gallery? No, they do, but they were always doing so anyway. And I don't think that it happens on any greater scale. Now, you could say it's more visible if people are behaving badly, and that's true. But then equally, ladies and gentlemen, some of the good things about Parliament are also more visible. Some days there are really good exchanges at Prime Minister's questions. We now and again have fantastic debates in the House, although I accept those will tend to be viewed only by the some hundreds of thousands, or in the course of a week, million people who watch parliamentary television. They won't necessarily get a wider audience unless there are clips on the nine or ten o'clock news, though there sometimes are, but we have fantastic debates of a cross-party character about restitution for the victims of the Hillsborough disaster. We had a fantastic debate about the report on Bloody Sunday in Northern Ireland. We have often very good debates on foreign affairs, and sometimes we have good debates on things like mental health and autism and so on. So I think a lot of that is out there for people to see. And I think, broadly speaking, it's been a positive for the House. The difficulty of it, and this is a, not an objection to televising Parliament, but it's a challenge to us, either to change the way we operate or to explain how we do operate, is that people often don't quite understand what makes up a parliamentarian's day or week. And one of the problems we have with televised Parliament is that people sometimes say, oh, I was very disappointed, Mr Berko. I switched on to watch you know, a big debate on X or Y or Z. And I was horrified that there were only 30, 40 people in the chamber. Where were the other 600? And do you understand, ladies and gentlemen, people think MPs are bunking off. Now, the truth is that off the top of my head, I could probably list at least 10 ways that an MP can be spending time. A member can be in the chamber asking a question or making a speech, attending a select committee, attending a legislation committee, attending a meeting of an all-party group, sitting in his or her office dealing with correspondence or emails, meeting a constituent in the House, meeting constituents in the constituency, fulfilling a speaking engagement elsewhere, you know, I think I've given you about eight sort of off the top of my head. So there are loads of ways MPs spend their time, and generally MPs attend the chamber if they wish to speak. But that's a challenge of communication and explanation to the public, because sometimes people think, oh, the MPs are bunking off. And that, I accept, is a challenge, to put it bluntly, bad for our reputation. But overall, I would happily settle for absolutely the continuation of televising, and it's up to us either to up or change our game or to improve our explanation of it. We certainly can't retreat from televising. It's the reality of where we are. What I'd like to think is that we might think about how we can have more short, snappy debates in Parliament of a kind that will engage the interest of people who haven't got the whole afternoon to spare, but who, if they have some idea when a key debate's going to be and it's going to be accessible, will access it. I think we had some further questions at the towards okay. the right. Um, yeah, maybe. Maybe you'd like to go. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry. Yes, of course. <laughs> like yes. to go first, and then then later on. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm Manfred Eisenman, treasurer of the British uh, German Society. I would be very interested to know if there were a reform of the upper house of the House of Lords, how much would it affect uh, the business of the chamber? Uh, the, 
Not my end. Yeah. Uh, the, business, the, the, the business of the chamber yeah. uh, at all and, and your role in particular. I don't think if there were... Thank you for that question. I don't think if there were a reform of the House of Lords, it would have all that much impact on the role of the Speaker in the Commons. But I think it would have a very marked influence on the Commons itself as a collective. The... central point, as far as I'm concerned, is that you know, when I was free to express a view on this vexed and controversial question of Lord's reform, which is very divisive, not just between, but within the parties, I did argue, ladies and gentlemen, in favour of a predominantly or even wholly elected second chamber, mainly because I felt that in the modern world, the idea that you can have a major legislative body operating without the democratic legitimacy conferred by election is not sustainable. I absolutely accept there are good features to the House of Lords, there are lots of terrific experts on subjects there and so on and so forth, but I did feel that it was a very significant, compelling argument against the existing structure. And I must admit I was the only Tory MP to vote for the immediate removal of all of the hereditary peers as long ago as 2007, because I'd come to the conclusion it was absolutely preposterous that people should sit in the House of Lords simply on the basis of accident of birth. So that was my view. That said, you know, it didn't happen, as you will know, the attempt to reform the House of Lords failed. And it failed basically because Tory MPs in quite large numbers didn't want it. Liberal Democrats did, but Tories didn't. And the Labour Party wasn't going to help the government to get its bill. Now, I therefore think for some time to come, Lord's reform is probably off the agenda. And if I may make so bold, I think that there was one error. I'm not saying it was what ruined it. I think it probably would have fallen anyway. There was one error I think the supporters of an elected second chamber made in the government. And that was that they didn't delineate the powers between the two chambers. There's a lot to be said for deciding, first, what do you want the chambers to do, and then deciding how to compose them. The government didn't really deal with that. They simply said in Clause 2, the primacy of the House of Commons will remain assured, or words to that effect. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that was, frankly, not very satisfactory, because if you... Sorry? Yeah, it was a sort of empty box. And if you were a supporter of an elected second chamber, you wouldn't have been influenced by that. And supporters of second chamber would very quickly have said, well, we're now elected as well, because we've got this reform, and we don't accept your primacy. Just because clause two of a bill says you're the primary chamber, we don't accept that. We're elected. We're elected, in our view, by a more legitimate method of proportional representation, or we've been elected more recently than you were. So we think that we're just as legitimate. So that issue would only have been resolved in advance if we'd had, as I say, a delineation or a codification of powers, and that did not happen. Now, as I say, I'm not saying that that's what wrecked the bill, but it didn't help the bill. Do I think it will happen any time soon? No. If we did have an elected second chamber, I think it would lead to greater rivalry between the two chambers, quite possibly, and it may lead to greater stoppages and delay in the progress of legislation. But I don't necessarily think that that would be a bad thing. I don't think Parliament should be a meat processing factory. In fact, it ought to operate with a rather greater regard for safety than that. And, you know, in a way, if we produce less legislation but it was of a better quality, that would be a good thing. I think there are, are good features of the Lords, but I still think it's fundamentally a weakness that it's an appointed house, appointed by accident of birth, or appointed as a result of recommendation by party leaders. So I would prefer still to see some progress in the direction of reform. But if you're asking me, would I take a trip to the betting shop for the first time in my life to bet on an elected second chamber or even a significantly reformed second chamber coming about any time soon, the answer's in the negative. We had a point over here. Ah, okay. Okay. Now, that's a real rarity. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, that's a real rarity in the House of Commons. Once in a blue moon, a member who I call says, oh, no, Mr. Speaker, my question has already been asked and answered. But most members feel that there is no harm in repeating the point, and most members feel they can make the point better than the person who's just made it. Anyone I think else? We had some other hands as well uh, on this side. It's a deathly hush. Maybe I can, can abuse I? Yes, my, please, my role, if that's okay. Um, one of the things you met that we haven't discussed in much length is coalition. Yeah. 
Um, now, now, one of the things you discussed that one of your challenges was trying to sort of reinforce the independence of parliament over the executive branch or reinforcing the ability of members of the parliament to scrutinize the executive. Has coalition government made that task easier in a way because it means, for example, that the government has to consult more often its backbenchers? Has it introduced new challenges in terms of the independence of parliament from the executive? Maybe you could say a few words on that. Yes, I would say uh, there have been a number of effects of coalition. Uh, first of all, I think it has made for a slightly more unpredictable parliament, which makes for a more exciting parliament, and potentially, I emphasize potentially, for a better parliament. Unpredictable, well, because the majority party in the coalition can't always be sure of getting the smaller partner on board, so it has to consult, and it probably has to produce slightly better arguments, or if it's a piece of draft legislation, a better quality bill, and it goes through that almost um, Socratic process of dialogue between the representatives of the two parties in the coalition, whereas if it was just producing it as a majority government, it wouldn't bother, frankly, to consult its own backbenchers on any great scale. So that, I think, is a positive. And even then, it can't be sure that it will get its way. So, for example, tuition fees was an issue that, in a sense, was partly predetermined because Nick Clegg conceded on that point at the time the coalition was formed. But even then, the Conservatives, although I think they knew that they would win the vote, knew that it was going to be awkward and messy because there was likely to be a considerable split amongst the Liberal Democrats, and there was. And broadly speaking, obviously Liberal Democrat ministers voted with the Conservatives because they were members of the government. Aspirant Liberal Democrat ministers, i.e. loyalists, voted with the government. Independent-minded backbenchers, or those, dare I say it, who were not members of the government on the Liberal benches, though they thought they ought to be, were more inclined to rebel against what they knew to be an unpopular policy, unpopular with their constituents and probably with most people's constituents. So that made for a, a very uncertain vote that night, and the government won the vote, but the Liberals faced in a number of different directions, and it was quite a piece of parliamentary theatre. The challenge for me that day was to make sure, as it is indeed every day, that even though they sit on the same side of the House, I have to know exactly who's a Liberal and who's a Conservative, and you'll very often get very different views from them on any one subject. And I had to have a sense of where the Liberal member who wanted to speak was coming from. Was that Liberal wanting to speak in support of the government or against it? Not a question of me vetting people in terms of what I wanted, but vetting people because I wanted to secure a balance. If I was going to call a loyalist Liberal Democrat to support the coalition's position on tuition fees, I needed to be sure that I called somebody like Greg Mulholland from Leeds, a big university town, who was furiously opposed to what he regarded as the Lib Dem front bench capitulating to the Tories. So that has made life very, very, very interesting indeed. Is Parliament on the whole stronger with the coalition? I would say because it is more unpredictable, you know, it has meant that the play of forces between the different parties in Parliament is that much greater. And as I say, day to day, my challenge is just to make sure, it may seem a rather prosaic challenge, just to make sure that those Liberal Democrat voices do get heard. It is in the nature of a coalition, if I may say so, that I think that each side of that coalition feels that the other has the upper hand. If you listen to Liberal Democrats, particularly left of centre Liberal Democrats, but quite a lot of Liberal Democrat members of Parliament, they are absolutely convinced that they have surrendered hook, line and sinker to the dominant Conservatives, and they're absolutely horrified by the huge fall in their party's support in the country. They've lost a lot of, of their left-wing voters to Labour, etc. Liberal Democrat support has been more than halved since the general election from around sort of 23%, 25% to sort of now 12 13% or thereabouts at best. On the other hand, if you talk to right-wing Tories or listen to right-wing Tories, they are firmly of the view that the Liberal Democrat 
tail is wagging the conservative dog. You listen to a man called Peter Bone, quite relevant in, if we're going to talk about wagging of tails of dogs and so on. <laughs> Peter Bone, who's a right-wing conservative MP, a very outspoken conservative MP in Northamptonshire, he's always complaining bitterly about the perfidious Liberal Democrats, politically correct Liberal Democrats, wimpish, left-wing, distasteful Liberal Democrats, you know, telling the government what to do. Now, you know, most of the coalition MPs put up with it, but as I say, there's a sizable body of Liberal Democrats who are utterly infuriated, and there's a sizable body of Conservative MPs who, who just don't want coalition at all. So in parliamentary terms, my challenge is to try to hear all these voices. And if you take something like, you know, the equal marriage debate, I mean, my concern is always with scrutiny. You know, I mean, personally, because of my track record on LGBT issues, you know, I'm enthusiastic about equal marriage. I didn't speak in the debate and, of course, wouldn't do so if constituents ask me what I think. I say, yes, I'm in favour of this, but, you know, I won't be voting because the Speaker mustn't vote. But my concern in the debate was that the voices should be heard. And on that issue, of course, you had a Conservative Prime Minister enthusiastically supporting the policy and a Liberal Democrat Deputy Prime Minister enthusiastically supporting the policy and virtually all the Liberals supporting the policy with a tiny number of mainly religiously motivated exceptions. But a solid phalanx, rather a large phalanx of right-wing Tories utterly hacked off with it. And my challenge as Speaker was to make sure that their voice was heard because they've got a right to be heard. It's nothing to do with what my views are. My views are irrelevant. My job is to make sure that Mr Bone and Nadine Dorries and various other Tory MPs, you know, who, who regard this as a destruction of marriage, well, they must be allowed to speak. I think we have time for one last uh, question. Who would like to round us off? Yes, please. That's a very interesting question. Has it changed over the years? Yes, I think it's changed a bit. How are they selected? Both of the... I'm not all that familiar with the Liberal Democrats' approach, although I think it's not radically different. Liberal Democrats have got a particular reputation for choosing local candidates. They often build their base at local government and then a local councillor will become the candidate for parliament in a seat. I would say probably on a bigger scale than in the Conservative and Labour parties. <coughs> Both of the major parties, sir, tend to have a central list of approved candidates, people who've been through a training weekend or maybe more, and, you know, they've been checked to ensure that they're reasonably clean, you know, there's no great cupboard full of skeletons or whatever, and they're usually people who've got a bit of experience, they've often held party office, they've possibly served in local government, or they've got a track record of working with the party, as well as preferably developing a career elsewhere. There's sometimes a bit of criticism that there are a lot of professional politicians who are selected as candidates. But I would say in the current parliament, there are a lot of people who've served as teachers or lawyers or bankers or marketing executives or charity workers, whatever. So I think sometimes this professional politician argument is slightly overstated. There are quite a lot of them, but there are a lot who aren't. And basically, people apply for seats when they come up. When I was on the Conservative candidates list, because I'd been through the parliamentary selection weekend and I'd been approved, I got notified whenever there was a vacancy. And basically what I did was I would tick the box and send it back to Conservative Central Office in those days by post, these days you'd probably do it by email, to signify that, yes, I would like my name to be put forward. It was rather centrally controlled by the party. You weren't encouraged to write to the constituency directly. I mean, was it a breach of the rules? No, but it wasn't encouraged. The party wanted to send the CVs to the constituency at the constituency level, a selection committee would be established of usually 8, 10, 12, maximum 15 people. They would sift the CVs, choose two to interview, and typically in the Tory party, and I think it's not radically different in the Labour Party, they would produce a short list of, say, for a, for a really good seat, like Buckingham, my seat, I think there were 205 applicants. They interviewed 20, and you're asked to speak for sort of five minutes or so, and then you answer questions for probably 25 minutes. And if you, and then they have a vote at the end of the day, and you get notified if you're through to the next round, it'll usually be a week later at most. 
and the next round would no normally be a final six, and they normally then go down to, and that will be in front of a bigger group, the executive of the local party, which might be 60 people. And then if you get through that, you're in front of the full association membership, or those of them that turn up, which will even then probably only be a, pro a minority. Why? Well, on any one day, people are doing something else. I think the Buckingham Association had about 1,000 members. I think there were about 220 turned up on the freezing cold night when it was snowing in Buckingham. And I was up against two other people, and I managed to, to get it. And by the way, as a sort of a minor point, but a complete nightmare when I was selected in Buckingham in February 1996, I had got through, ladies and gentlemen, I was very aggrieved, extremely aggrieved. I expect you to get out your violin and play in sympathy with me. I was very aggrieved. I got through in Surrey, which is now Michael Gove's constituency, Surrey Heath, and in Buckingham to the next round, and to the semi-final in Surrey and the final in Buckingham. And the Conservative agent from Central Office phoned me up and said, do you want the good news or the bad news, John? And I said, well, let's start with the good. And he said, the good news is you're through in both Surrey and Buckingham to the next round. And I said, oh, splendid. I said, what's the bad news? He said, unfortunately, the selection process for each is taking place on the same night. So, you know, you'll have to choose which to go for and pull out from the other. And I, being the rather cussed character I am, I said, but I'm not doing that. And he said, well, you'll have to. And I said, no, no, but David, I've been pushed through in both. And he said, yes, but they're on the same night. And I said, well, that's not my fault. With great respect, you're the central office agent. You know, they shouldn't be taking place on the same night. And he said, well, you know, it's all very well for you to say, but that's the situation. You'll have to withdraw from one. And I said, well, can you tell me when, is, when are they? You know, when in the evening? And I arranged to go on first in Surrey and last in Buckingham. I was absolutely determined to give myself the best chance. So I took the rather unusual step through a, a friend of hiring a helicopter <laughs> to travel from one to the other. The one downside of this, ladies and gentlemen, was when I got to Buckingham, and I was successful in Buckingham, and I arrived with hardly a moment to spare, having arrived on a, a little sort of airfield, a little sort of lawn almost, a patch of grass or whatever, in a couple of miles from the, the school where the meeting was. I think the one disadvantage of telling them that I had arrived by flight and was that they probably all thought that I was fabulously wealthy, which in fact I absolutely wasn't. It had cost me about a £1,000 to hire this wretched thing, but it was the best £1,000 I'd ever spent. And, and I was lucky enough to be selected. So that's the approach now. I mean, I think it used to be different, and there were times in the past when it was not competitive. Ian MacLeod, for the, who became a very distinguished Conservative cabinet minister, he was selected for his first seat without competition. Nobody else wanted to stand in some, some hopeless seat, and then he got a better seat. You usually have to fight a hopeless seat first. If I may, I'll conclude by saying that our longest-serving member in our parliament is Sir Peter Tapsell, who is the Conservative member for Louth and Horncastle in Lincolnshire. And he always tells me, that he was selected first for West Nottingham, which he represented from 1959 to 64. He then lost that seat, because it was marginal, in 66. Uh, sorry, lost that seat in 64, came back in 66 for Louth and Horncastle, which he continues to represent to this day. And so he's our most senior member. He served over 50 years in the House. I can never match Sir Peter. But Sir Peter's manner, just so you're, you talk about old fogies or codgers or whatever, I wouldn't dream of making such a disobliging remark about the honourable gentleman as a figure of great distinction in the House. But Sir Peter's typical question will be, is my right honourable friend the Prime Minister aware that in 1955, when I served as personal assistant to Sir Anthony Eden, he advised me then that ad hominem attacks upon the character of one's opponents was invariably counterproductive and would sit down. That's a sort of Sir Peter type <laughs> question. So I don't know what he would tell you about the process, but I think it's more formal and, dare I say it, I think probably more competitive than it was 50 years ago. But the, the biggest difference with MPs is that these days you basically have to live in your patch and you certainly, or, or have a home there, and you've certainly got to deal with constituency work, you know, conscientiously. I once went on a trip um, with Shirley Williams to the West Bank and Gaza. And Shirley Williams was a very distinguished Labour cabinet minister and then formed the SDP, the Centre Party in the 1980s, beginning of the 80s. And Shirley is a, a delightful person, but she amazed me by saying that when she was first elected, she didn't stage surgeries, which we all do now, advice bureau, you know, with our constituents. 
And I said, you're, you're joking, Shirley. She said, oh, no, I didn't stage surgery. She said, neither did Ian McLeod. She said, in fact, most of us didn't. And it was the culture of the time, John, it, it just didn't happen. So anyway, she said, but I did answer my correspondence. And I said, well, I'm mightily glad to hear it. And she said, yes, but not everybody did. I shared an office first with a Labour MP who just inherited the seat. He'd been the National Union of Mine Workers <laughs> official. And some old codger died, and he got selected almost as a prize when he was in his late 50s or 60s as the MP for some rock-solid Labour seat. He said, she said, and she didn't tell me his name, and I didn't ask. She said, I shared an office with him, and one day I saw him throwing letters in the bin. And I said to him, you know, you really shouldn't be throwing those letters away. Those constituents of yours, they need your help. To which this chap replied, nay, lass, if it's important, they'll send a telegram. <laughs> you couldn't get away with that today. <laughs> But, uh, thank you very much, everyone. It, well, it just uh, is left to me to do two things. One is that, um, like in the House of Commons, we had a good discussion, but we also have a drink afterwards. So you're all very warmly invited to, uh, to have a drink with us uh, after this session. And the last thing is, once again, to very much thank uh, John Burko. Um, we're very, very pleased to have you here at the Hertie School, and we hope that we can welcome you here again soon. Thank you. <laughs>